I mean, Hamish Henderson was a bit of a character, actually. I mean, he's known, and most folk will know him for his the great John McLean March song that he wrote, um, and his other great internationalist song, which was um, Freedom Come All Ye. Um, and I'll talk about these in the talk, but um, there's a, a lot more to him than that. He was what the uh, intellectual establishment would call a polymath, I think the word is, a kind of renaissance man, as they say. He uh, was an incredibly talented character. I don't know if folk have seen it, but it was a recent documentary f film. Hamish died in 2002, but it was a documentary film made about my saw it last year in the GFT, and they only had it on for a few days. But it was also in BBC Alba, with a, in Gaelic, but with a, an English, English subtitles. And actually, you can still get it on um, BBC iPlayer. I checked, it's still on BBC iPlayer. It's a, it's a fascinating compilation of film and talk and people talking about Hamish, some of his contemporaries, other people who've been influenced by him, and there's bits of Hamish himself in it. And he's a character that certainly could fill a film um, about his life, because he was such a very an interesting character. I mean, um, in January I went to, there was a, a commemoration concert for him because in 1919, he was born in 1919, so it would be centenary, there was a centenary concert in the uh, in the Mitchell Theatre and it was packed. And, and actually most of the folk there were our generation, you know, people who were about to retire or retire, but there was a whole load of youngsters there as well. And what was interesting was that the, the musicians were all young musicians who'd gone to the Edinburgh School of Scottish Studies or to the folk school. And these were things that were instituted by Hamish Henderson in the 50s and the 60s uh, through his work. And they were, I mean, they were obviously massively pleased to be commemorating somebody like Hamish Henderson. So it's not just a piece of history, uh, it's the stuff's alive and living. And it's, it's, of, it's of interest to young people. And not just culturally, but politically, I think Hamish Henderson is a, an inspiration to people. So I want to, I won't go too long, I want to talk about him and then people come in and we can have a discussion. I'll talk a bit, a bit about his life and his strange, odd origins, if you like, and a bit about, a bit about his songs. I'm not gonna, I promise you I won't sing, so you don't need to leave the room. Um, and a bit about but, but his, 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 his politics in general. I mean, because there's some fascinating things about the man. Did some incredible things. Um, he was he actually, as I said, he died in 2002. Um, survived by his, his, his wife, um, who was a German woman that he married, and their two daughters. Um, he was actually born, as I said, a century ago in Blair Gowrie in Perthshire. Um, he didn't know it at the time, but he was the illegitimate son of the Duke of Athol. He wasn't aware of his noble ancestry because his mother was a kitchen maid and a single parent. And, the, and despite his, uh, his esteemed parentage on one side of the family, he was poor. They grew up in a you know, rural poor, uh, Glen Shee, Blair Gowrie, that area. And when he was quite young, he moved with his mother to England because his mother had to move to look for work. And although he was poor, he was a very um, curious, imaginative, and, 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 and clever kid. Um, and his mother was doted on, doted on him. And his mother, although poor working class woman, was a great reader as well and encouraged him to read. And he won a, he won a, a bursary scholarship to uh, what's a, a, a fairly prestigious school in England uh, called Dulwich School. And when he was 12, when he was just about to start his schooling in this esteemed school, his mother died and he had to move into an orphanage. He was a kid with her parents, he had to live in an orphanage and go to study from, from his orphanage. Later on, um, a middle class family in England adopted him and they were able to fund his schooling and actually he was so clever, and for a working class kid he was so clever, he went to Cambridge University to study languages, particularly European languages. Um, Probably the most decisive thing, both culturally and politically in his life, was after he graduated from Cambridge, he went to Germany in the 30s to study. He was fascinated by German culture, German language, and he went to study as a postgraduate in Germany. At the time, Hitler was coming to power in the 30s. And the things that he saw in, in, in Germany made him, I think he was had political aspirations anyway, but they made him political. It politicised him to the extent that he became a communist 
He joined the resistance in Germany against Hitler and was instrumental in getting, allowing Jews to, and organising for Jews to escape. And when the, I mean, he wasn't a, a militarist in any sense. He was actually, I wouldn't say he was a pacifist, but he was certainly anti-war. But such was his convictions about the rise of fascism. Like a lot of people of that generation, like my father and his brothers, you know, people like my mother, although for, for the ruling class it was a war to defend their empire, you know, competition between Germany and so on and other. For ordinary working people, it was a war to defeat fascism, especially after what had happened in Spain. And he felt it was his duty to enlist as a soldier and fight against fascism, as a lot of people did. Um, I'm not saying that was the ruling class's attitude, but that was certainly the attitude of a lot of people, uh, uh, like Hamish Henderson. Of course, when he enlisted to join the army, when the bigwigs found out about his linguistic talents and his intellectual depth, if you like, he was transferred into the, the military intelligence corps and actually was put to the use of interrogating German prisoners to get information from them because he actually had a command of six European languages and he was, um, he was also fond of German culture. Despite the Nazis, he had a great understanding of German culture and therefore could communicate with the prisoners and was quite useful. Um, later, um, uh, fairly early, he was actually sent with the Eighth Army to North Africa, um, uh, in the Desert War, as it was, as it was, you know, the Battle of Alamein and all that stuff. And he operated as a military intelligence of officer there. The background and the experience in the North African desert uh, led him to write one of the finest anti-war poetry books uh, called um, "The Elegy for the Dead in Cyrenaica." Cyrenaica is where Libya is now, but it's the it was where the battles were being fought in the, the North African desert. It's between, it's between the Egyptian border and, 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 and what, what is Libya. Um, and he wrote this. That, that book, E.P. Thompson, the historian, said it's the, he was the finest war poet in the Second World War. And later on, uh, he won, it won the Somerset, I'm not a big fan of Somerset Mom, but it won the Somerset Mom Award for poetry. So he was a very talented man. Um, later on, he's with the Eighth Army, he, they, they went to Sicily in Italy, and actually he was a, a, a great Italian speaker as well, a very very intelligent man. And he's he was in, in Italy, he was made the liaison officer with the communist partisans in the Eighth Army, and he worked with them and, 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 and fought alongside them. And again, taking Italian prisoners. One of his greatest uh, experiences was he actually as the military intelligence officer with the partisans. He took the surrender of the Italian army from a Marshal Graziano. You know, so here's this wee boy that grew up in, in uh, Blair Gowrie, is taking the surrender of the Italian Of course, the, the Germans continued to fight on, but the Italians surrendered. And um, his experience in, in Italy made him what, what, what you would call an Italianophile. He fell in love with Italy. The people that he fought alongside, the, the partisans, the Italian communists, the socialists, the Italian people, the Italian language and Italian culture. Um, and later on, at the end of the war, um, he went back, he, he also, he came in contact with the ideas of Antonio Gramsci. I don't know if people know about Gramsci. Gramsci was the leader of the Italian communist movement, the founder of the Italian communist movement in a sense. He'd been involved in the, the, what was called the uh, magazine Lordini Nuovo, when the, when the communist party was fi finally launched after the First World War. Gramsci had been, he was a, an immigrant from Sardinia, so he wasn't a native Italian. Well, he, was, he was an Italian, but he was, a, 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 if you like, an Italian colonial. And he'd come as a student to Turin. He was involved in the big Turin occupation of the factories at the end of the First World War, what was called Italy's Two Red Years, when the Italian Communist Party was formed. And of course, the failure of the revolution in Italy led eventually to the triumph of Mussolini and the rise of fascism. And, and Gramsci had been imprisoned because that's how they were frightened to, to, to assassinate Gramsci and make him a martyr in case it caused resistance. There was resistance against Mussolini, but in case the underground resistance rose up, so they held him in prison and, 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 and he spent his life in prison. But in prison, he secretly wrote prison notebooks and, and, and Hamish Henderson did the, went to Italy and did the, after the war and did the first translation of Gramsci into English. Um, Unfortunately, he was kicked out of Italy because by then it was the Cold War. Um, the uh, CIA influence in Italy and other states was such that communists were seen as threats to the Italian society and he was deported. 
But uh, Hamish Henderson's translation of Gramsci's prison notebooks were later published by the Edinburgh Review um, and, and, and made into a book as late as 1988. So in a sense, it was one of the breakthroughs. Gramsci had not been known about, really. Although he was famous, he hadn't been known about, in, 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 certainly not in Britain, and it, it popularised Gramsci's ideas, certainly in Scotland and England. I mean, I remember as a kid joining the international socialist scene, this book about Gramsci, and it had been translated by, by Hamish Henderson. Um, The other thing about Hamish, was, which, which brings us on to his musical connection, in his pre-war studies at Cambridge University, because he was studying European culture, he'd become involved in collecting um, traditional collections of traditional Scottish folk music. And it led him to believe, when he, when he studied it, that these, many of these traditions were continuing. They hadn't died, they weren't in history, they were continuing, particularly in this, among the travelling people, among the sort of shepherds and the, the poor country people, but mainly the travelling people in the northeast of Scotland and the Scottish borders and the west coast. And he actually got together a, ta a primitive tape recorder and went out into the field to record these old bothy ballads, folk songs that were narratives of the life of ordinary working people. He was to Scotland what Alan Lomax was, if you like, to America, who Alan Lomax catalogued and collected and, and, and interviewed and tape recorded all the great blues and folk singers, black and white, right across America. And Hamish, Himlach, uh, Hamish Henderson in Scotland did that in, for Scotland. And in a sense, that led to directly to the big folk boom in the 50s and the 60s, the development of traditional Scottish folk music. The stuff that we now celebrate at Celtic Connections <coughs> was down in a large extent to the, the work done, the field work done, done by Hamish Henderson. I know, but we'll come to that later. <laughs> but he did, I mean, he, he discovered, if they were there all the time, it's like somebody said they, they discovered the Indians, they were there all the time. He discovered, uh, you know, people like Jeannie Robertson and, and Fiona McNeil and many other great balladeer singers, people who became actually much more famous abroad in America, are celebrated in America as the, the origins of the traditional American folk music that came from Scotland, Ireland and England, um, more so than, than she was here. But Jeannie Robertson is regarded as the prime uh, ballad singer, um, singing the songs and the tales and the bothy ballads that are so funny and so powerful and sometimes so brutal about the life that ordinary Scottish people lived. The same was happening in England, there was people collecting stuff, but Hamish was central to that movement and, and, and went on to develop it. The, the problem was when he'd collected all this stuff, what was he going to do with it? Because at this time in the early 50s, there was no, uh, there was no University of Edinburgh traditional you know, course in Scottish folk music or anything. Hamish Henderson founded it and actually would later become a visiting professor at Edinburgh University on Scot the, 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 the Scottish culture and Scottish folk music and developed it today. And it was through really popularising and bringing these famous balladeers into the, the you know, to, to Edinburgh and Glasgow, to the folk culture, to, to, for them to be discovered by the urban population and much wider. That, he, he, that, 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 that um, Hamish got in touch with people like, and worked alongside people like Ewan, McC Ewan McCall, uh, Norman Buchan, Adam McNaughton that people may know about. If you don't know about Adam McNaughton, you can do a meeting on himself. He's a man who wrote the Julie Peace song, along with a lot of other great songs. And, and Pete Seeger, Pete Seeger was a huge fan of Hamish Henderson's. There's a tape, Pete Seeger talking in America about the importance of Hamish Henderson for our tradition he talks about in America. Because these were songs that were transported across the world with the, the, the Scottish and the English diaspora in the, the 19th and 20th centuries that they influenced uh, American music in a big way as well. Um, and, and, and out of that, um, were set up the, the, the People's Festivals in Edinburgh in 1951, 52 and 53. This was a deliberate attempt to challenge what was seen as the highbrow bourgeois culture. And don't get me wrong, I'm in favour of bourgeois culture. I like listening to Mozart. I like poetry and stuff like that. I'm sure most of you do. But this was at the exclusion of what the common ordinary work of people were doing. So the popular Hamish Henderson and, and McCall and people like that 
were campaigning for popular festivals that would attract ordinary working class people and teach them and involve them in their own history, their own traditions, which was an often distinct from the, 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 the traditions and the history of the ruling class. It was very political, in other words. It was about teaching people about their origins and their past, who they came from, and what the struggles of the past were about, how people lived and survived. And actually, they did that. It was very successful. It was so successful that eventually the right in the Labour movement uh, in Edinburgh City Council uh, shut it down as a threat to the, 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 the Edinburgh Festival itself. And although it was shut down, it, went on to, it, was, it was really the forerunner of what we now know as the Edinburgh Finch Festival, which is much more popular and open. I'm not saying everything it does is it's good, but it gives a variety and a, 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 an interest to ordinary people that the otherwise old style Edinburgh Festival would never have had. And it also had a big influence international, internationally and encouraging and developing other folk festivals like the, 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 the Italian Communist Party's um, uh, the Festival of Unity, as it was called, uh, in Italy, developed in, in, in response to these things. It was massive. And it, it meant that it started to become part, that whole history, our history started to become part of official Scottish culture taught at the universities. But it was a, there was a struggle to have it done. Um, and in, in 1956, Hamish, like a lot of other people at the time, kind of moved away from the Communist Party because of the invasion of Hungary, but he remained a committed socialist Marxist and an activist. Um, because he wasn't just a poet, he wasn't just a, a cultural icon, he was an activist in the movement and a supporter of the movement. For example, he was, a, he was an opponent of apartheid and an anti, a, 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 a determined anti-racist. He was arrested uh, in the protests against uh, the, 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 South African, the South African rugby tour in 1970. I remember being going to Murrayfield uh, when they were playing and we invaded the pitch. And he got arrested, and along with lots of other people, I think he's, he was, uh, his fine was paid by John Lennon. God bless him. Right. He was, he was, um, he was um, heavily involved in anti-apartheid and things like that. He, he also was, um, in, in the eighties, he was um, told he was going to be given an OBE by Thatcher, in 1983, which actually must have confused him and bemused him quite a bit. Um, because he was actually persona non grata up until then, because he was a communist, because of the stuff in Italy, a lot of the poetry and the songs he'd, he'd written, the, the, the war songs that were coming to later, particularly his songs about Italy and Africa, were collected into the, the, uh, the ba ballad songs of the war. And they were anti-war songs, but they were published privately and discreetly, um, really because the Cold War atmosphere he would have been blacklisted everywhere. These were leaked to Lord Rees to the beat, who ran the BBC at the time, the cultural guru who told us what was good for us. And Hamish Henderson was in the process of doing or, or making a programme in BBC Scotland about all this, and it was banned. He was banned from the BBC for 10 years because Rees saw him as a Marxist uh, agitator, troublemaker. So in other words, um, and, and then when, when, when he rejected, then the, the irony is that when he rejected Thatcher's OBE, he won the Scott of the Year award in BBC, among BBC Radio Scotland listeners, largely because he refused to take the OBE from Thatcher, because he was an anti-poll tax person as well. He was involved in stuff like that. He, he, was, he was involved in all these things. The thing that was neat on about Hamish as well, and he, he never had it, he was, he was bisexual. He loved men and women. And he was open about it, and he campaigned in favour of gay rights. And in many senses, it's strange that he was, he was a soldier because he was such a, a beautiful person who was open to everybody, open to the world, open to men and women, a, a, a person who believed in inclusivity, you know, anti-sectarian, anti-discriminatory and, and throughout his whole life. And that's what his, his life was like. So right through to the end, he did that. Probably he end up with saying he's... Despite the fact that he was a polymath and he'd done all these things, he'll be known for his songs and some of his famous songs that, that we're going to obviously play later today. That'll be his lasting legacy. In 1948, um, Maurice Blythman, who was a Communist Party member at the time with him, I think, um, convinced him to write the commemoration song for the anniversary of, of, of John McLean's uh, 
Was it the anniversary? I no, but the 25th anniversary mm. of John McLean's death. And it was coinciding with the launch of the John McLean Society, a big event in Edinburgh where, you know, McDermott and people like that would be speaking. Um, Harry McShay and others, other people who founded the John McLean Society. And that's where the, the, the great song, the, 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 the John McLean March, comes from. It tells the story of McLean being released. McLean is in jail, jailed in May 1918, his famous speech at the dock. In 1918, when McLean was held in Duke Street Prison waiting his trial, 100,000 workers in Glasgow went to strike and marched to to Duke Street Prison where he was being held in solidarity with the Russian Revolution and in opposition to the First World War. Maclean went to the High Court in Edinburgh, made his speech with the docks and was given five years penal servitude in Peterhead Prison. Actually, popular pressure both in Britain and internationally, including Russia and Germany and everywhere else, the German Revolution, the end of the war, forced them to release Maclean. They didn't release him because they were kind, they released him because they were worried about the impact of keeping him in jail, especially when he'd been chosen, despite the leadership of the Labour Party, as the candidate for the Gorbals, and he would be standing against the Labour. So they released him because they were more worried that if he was elected, like at Convict 99 in prison, it would cause more outrage than was already there. So Maclean was released. He'd been through hunger strikes, he'd been force fed, he was quite ill, but he came back and a hundred, I don't know, but the newspaper said 100,000 people came to greet him in March in commemoration and I'm getting out of jail. And that, the song's the story of that march. It's wonderful internationalism. It's argument about the red and the green being worn side by side. You know, anti-imperialist in favour of Irish freedom. Fantastic song that, 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 that we'll sing. And, 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 you know, that, that John McLean wrote it for that. And since then, it's celebrated throughout the left. And internationally, again, it's probably better known internationally than it is in his native land. His other great song was The Freedom Come All Ye, which many folk think, think should be the alternative Scottish national anthem to replace the stupid... What's, what's the one? Flair of Scotland. Flair of Scotland stuff. You know, the, 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 the rosy-eyed romantic past about Scotland. I know, but, but Hamish was an internationalist and he, he said he would rather it was an international anthem than a national anthem because it is, because it is internationalist. I mean, I've not got time to go through. The problem is a lot of Scots wouldn't know the words yet because it's written in the language that my granny spoke, Lallans, right? The words, you know, like Danny Fecht and all that. And those words. Beautiful, beautiful poetry. But it's again, it's like Burns's poetry. It's not all over the globe. Our kids didn't get. I mean, when I was a kid, we didn't know anything about it in school. We never got it as poetry, and um, we should have. Um, but it's a fantastic poem. I mean, it, it ends. The last verse in it is about yon black glad fin I anger dinging down the the, the the burgers doom. It's about internationalism. It's about anti-colonialism. It's a fantastic song. And you know, I'm, I mean, I'm not a big fan of national anthems, but I think it's a song that should be celebrated. I mean, he also wrote when he was at, when he was in North Africa and Italy. He wrote he wrote songs of the war. Um, he wrote the I always forget the title of it because it's called the Fifty First Highlands Division's Farewell to Sicily. People know it's the Banks of Sicily. It's a he wrote the lyrics to what was a beautiful Highland pipe tune, and it's it's played today. I mean, I know that it's one Maureen McCallum who's not here today. It's one of her favourite songs. He also wrote. Um, the, the, as I said, the, 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 the songs about North Africa and, and made them into that book of ballads of the, the, the Second World War, which was kind of banned. But my favourite, and I'm going to kind of end on it, is a, a song called The D-Day Dodgers. It's a song, I, I didn't even, when I was a kid, I didn't know who Amy Shenderson was, but I remember in Sunday nights in the 50s, my mum and dad used to take me to my grannies, and my grannies on a Sunday night was a big gathering of people who would come in and they would sing songs and get a few bottles of beer and some whiskey. And eventually as the night went on, it got merrier and merrier and you would go up to sing. I even used to get up past to sing Tony <laughs> Steele songs. I showed you how long ago it was. But I, I loved it because I get sitting up behind the couch listening to this, learning kind of oral history in itself about what people had been through in the war. And Uncle Edward had been in the Eighth Army. He was one of the D-Day Dodgers, if you like. He was he was he, he was at Salerno and right up through Italy, and he was a good singer. My granny used to think he should have been an opera singer. He wasn't that good, but he was a good he, he could sing. Big shy fella, but he was a good singer. And he used to sing this song, the D-Day Dodgers, and I used to love it because it was so funny and witty. And it was what had happened was a woman called Lady Astor, one of the idle rich, had attacked the Eighth Army for sunning themselves, you know, for living 
the life of Riley in Italy, where the real fighting was being done in the the Normandy beaches and stuff like that. So it was a huge attack on these skivers in Italy when exact opposite was the case. So I think it's probably worth, I'll not sing it, although I may sing along it, but I think it captures both. Henderson collected it from the words of soldiers in the Eighth Army and the tales that they told. And they're, they're, they're naturally sort of proletarian hatred of this woman. And, and you know the, 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 the war that they were fighting was a different war for the one she was fighting that they were fighting for freedom and liberty and for a better world she was fighting to keep the British ruling class in power and their empire in place and it, it's reflected in the song I think it's a bit coarse but Henderson wasn't a snob he would use the language of ordinary people to explain their, 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 their emotions and their feelings and their collectivity so I th I'm going to just sort of read it along to you it's to the tune of and because he was uh, influenced by German culture, it's to the tune of an old German song, of, a can anti war song by Germans in the Second World War, Lily Marlene. You know, it's to that tune. Um, we are the D Day Dodgers out in Italy, always in the Vino, always in the Spree. Eighth Army scroungers in our tanks. We live in Rome among the Yanks. We are the D Day Dodgers in sunny Italy. We landed in Salerno, a holiday with pay. The Jerry's brought their band out to cheer us on our way. Showed us the sights and gave us tea. We all sang songs, the beer was free. We are the D-Day Dodgers out in Italy. On our way to Florence we had a lovely time. We ran a bus to Rimini right through the Gothic line. On to Bologna we did go, then went bathing in the Po. We are the D-Day Dodgers here in Italy. Once we were told we were going home, back to dear old Blighty, never more to Rome. Then somebody said in France you'll fight. We said no, we'll just sit tight. We are the DD Dodgers here in Italy. Now Lady Astor, get a load of this. Don't stand on a platform and talk a load of piss. You're the nation's sweetheart, the nation's pride. We think your mouth's too bloody wide. We are the DD Dodgers in sunny Italy. In the last verse, I think the last verse hits it in the head. Look round the mountains through the mud and rain. There you'll find the crosses, some which bear no name. Heartbreak and toil and suffering gone, the boys beneath them slumber on. They were the D-Day Dodgers who'll stay in Italy. So, that's Amy Shenderson for you. So maybe we can have a wee discussion. There was a lot of talk about the wasn't there? Oh, Lady Astor, we'll make Lady Astor wash minor dirty socks <laughs> for the Red Revolution bunks. <laughs>